The Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the eastern shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. Today's episode is sponsored by JFM Enterprises, providing distinctive ready-made and custom frames and moldings to the trade since 1974. Visit jfm.net to view their catalog of designs. I talked like truly when I was wrapping Christmas presents for I think like three and a half hours over the holidays. Oh, that was like my worst nightmare. Not with Kim, not with Jeff. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. This is like Love you too. talk for three and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, we had a we covered every. Oh my single, god, like, my battery life would have me charge my phone twice to do that. Ex- well, exactly. It was therapy. It was yeah. therapy, man. Yeah, we invoiced each other, but the, but net it all it all netted out, so we didn't actually owe each other any money. Well, you both look good today, and you sound good, so you must have done something good for each other. There you go. See. It is, uh, Tim, buckle in here yeah. for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the longest plein air podcast. That's why it's good right. I have a hard stop, or we could talk for days. Right. right. She did. This is the first one she ever put a hard stop in for, so that's true. Welcome back to the plein air Easton podcast, everyone. This is our first podcast for 2022. We are excited to be back again. Uh, Jess, I'm going to let you take this intro over because this is one of your best buddies from Plan Air that you've made. <laughs> not not your best, but one of your one of your one of your best one of your best buddies you made. I don't like to rank my friends. That's I think exactly it's a very right. dangerous thing. Cam Vanderhoek is a great um, a, a great friend. She is a great artist. I always have a good time talking to her. I think that you are in for a treat. Um, she's a great conversationalist. She's really really you know she's just and really wants to talk about she's it. She's smart and dynamic, and she loves what she does. And so you know you want to talk business, you want to talk creativity, you want to talk. Um, parenting or even music she's a great she, she's a great resource so I hope you enjoy this interview with my friend Kim thank you very much let's start the podcast Tim what do you think we just did welcome everybody to the Planner Easton podcast I'm happy new year happy new year Jess <laughs> I'm here with uh, Jess Bells. My name is Tim Wigan, and welcome back, everyone. We are very excited to make 2022 podcasts better than 2021 podcasts, like we like 2022 to be better than 2021. So that is our goal, and we are talking today with uh, Kim. Or here we go. I'm going to go with the names again. Vander Hook or Vander Hoke? Vander Hoke. Vander Hoke. Vanderhoek. I think okay. I've been mispronouncing it for ten years. We, That's okay. Maybe I just <laughs> I mostly do a lot of things. Maybe I just hey, mostly mumble it. <laughs> <laughs> Kim is so good to because we actually can see her physically. It is so good to see Kim. I, I will. I will in full disclosure admit that um, Kim is a dear friend of mine, and we talk a lot. Yes. Um, <laughs> offline, online, to one another. She has been um, a. A bright spot through the dark pandemic for me. So I appreciate her friendship, but this makes it like kind of a strange <laughs> podcast in that way. Interviewing your friend, sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah more yeah. than a friend, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, because she knows more, where the more, bodies are buried. More so. than a friend. That sounded like the, <laughs> so, I don't know that we need that innuendo out there, but um, that sounds like <laughs> a nice. 19- See, we've already just like completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> but Dina in the other room is giving us a thumbs up for the. For the innuendo, so I appreciate awesome. it. <laughs> um, Cam, um, I always love to start, and it is interesting for me because, you know, I, while I know you, I do not know everything about you. You are a West Coast gal. But tell me about your childhood and how art was or was not a part of, of your sort of upbringing, your education, your family life, that sort of thing. Sure. Should I lay down on the couch? And yes. Look? Yes. I make yourself born in make yourself comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on a on a small hilltop. No, um, I grew up in a mountain town uh, called Big Bear. It's a ski resort town, which um, is kind of unusual for a Southern Californian. Like we would get snow in the winter, and yeah. um, work was very seasonal, and it was very much a small town life. Like you'd run into people that you knew going to the grocery store. But as far as art goes, 
you know, I know everybody says, oh, you know, I used to paint and draw when I was a kid. And I do remember doing that, but not to any more, I don't know, not to any degree that's larger than what my own kids do now. But what I do remember is my mom and I making stuff together at the dining room table a lot. And I remember that that was where she and I would connect. And that was, I don't know, some of the really strong memories of spending time with my mom during my childhood. So I think for me, it's not about what I was doing, like what I was using to create. It was just about the fact that I really enjoyed creating things with my hands. And and I think that's true for every artist, whether you're a musician or a visual artist or whatnot, that we we enjoy the process of creation. It's not always about the outcome. It's really about that experience of of making something out of nothing or out of a you know random stuff like you know colored goo that you smear on a, <laughs> a flat surface. So um, here, here. yeah, that's kind of how it started. And you know, I didn't really have art training. As a child, it wasn't until, um, let's see, maybe high school, I took some good art classes and then definitely figured out that I wanted a creative career in college. But my parents were like, no, you can't, you can't major in painting, honey, you need a real job. Um, <laughs> so, so wait, so, so back up and tell, so you did go to college. I yes. Did. But yes. your major was something that was not necessarily like art related. It was. Um, I Fortunately for me, my aunt is, well, was, she's retired now. She was a graphic designer who owned her own company. So to compromise with my parents, I said, well, what if I went into the commercial arts? You know, what if I went into graphic design? Because that was something they could understand. They saw that she was successful in running her own business and that you could actually earn a living doing that. So that was okay for them. So I actually started out as a graphic design major. And then about halfway through, I realized, you know, I'd rather be an illustration major because, again, I liked creating, you know, I like yep. drawing and painting. That yep. was where my heart was. But ironically, um, I didn't end up doing that as my nine to five career job. Um, when I graduated, a series of family misfortunes happened. My stepfather got terminal cancer the recession was in full swing. My parents had lost a business that they'd had for 20 years. Like a whole series of events happened right at that time. And my mom was like, you got to have a job the day you graduate because we can't help right. you. The, the, the payroll is over. <laughs> right. Sure. Right. And she had her hands full with sure. him and his treatment. So I, I got the first job that I could and ended up in the graphic design field because it was much easier to earn a living. And and I think anyone that has worked as an illustrator, you know that it takes like at least a year, maybe one to three years to develop enough of a clientele to earn a living as an illustrator. So throughout my graphic design career, I did some illustration, but not not daily. I wish that I had, you know, I'd be so much, I'd be such a better artist if I, if I had done all that, but. You know. Did you like that time as a graphic artist? Like how how long how long a time period are we talking about there? Where you were you like that was your full time gig? Um, it was about twelve years, and I I liked it. There were some things, of course, that I didn't like about it, but um, I feel really lucky that I ended up in that field because right when I graduated was right when. Um, everyone started switching from doing graphic design by hand to computers. And I was trained um, through college and how to do it by hand. So that's what I knew. But when I got out, I got a job, luckily, that taught me a lot about, um, you know, working different applications on a computer and was able to kind of really slide right into that career. So Everything that I learned as a graphic designer, I absolutely use today as a fine artist. I um, I know how to color correct photos in Photoshop. I know how to do a lot of graphic design work for myself, you know, creating ads or, you know, just, I don't know, all the, all the little technical things, writing copy, you know, understanding how to market things. Graphic design really taught me a lot about marketing campaigns and 
kind of what people like to see. So that helps me market myself as an artist. No, this so so just... far, this is exactly the same thing that Lon Brower said. In the <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you know, but one thing, one thing that I think is a, is a theme that keeps like coming up over and over again in these podcasts is that, that I think are surprising to, to people like me who are not painters or artists is just how much time it takes to do the sort of administrative or business side of running an art career. You know, there, I think that there's this fantasy or vision. Uh, and I, I think it's like exacerbated by people like us who see you we guys see at festivals. Paint. Right. We see you guys just like painting your asses off out there. And yeah. like, that's not really like a day in the life of Kim Vanderhoek. Like it's not. No. It's, it's <laughs> no. not. And it, there's a whole lot else. And, and there's a whole other sort of skill set that's involved in in like having an actual art career yeah yeah absolutely it, it kind of reminds me of you know the, i watch that show shark tank all the time mm -hmm. and they always ask and they're like well you know you're starting <clears throat> this new business how dedicated and you're still going to school or you're still going you know how do you how do you how dedicated are you to it because i need somebody who's dedicated or whatever but it sounds like, in most cases, as Justice explained, that you're for a long time until you get to a certain point. I guess you're, you're and it makes. I mean, we've heard this before. You're balancing. A it's whole not bunch even of like everything. to a different point. It's like you know. I think that Kim is a prime example of somebody who is a successful full time artist, and what that means is. What percentage of your time are you painting, Kim, versus, like you said, laying out your ads, watching your social media, handling your um, website, you know, mm -hmm. doing education or um, uh, 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 collector outreach, applying to, you know, like what percentage of time is actually with brush in hand, even as a like full time professional? If I'm very lucky on a good week, maybe 50 percent of my time, maybe, yeah, maybe because. You know, yeah. And then I have all the other life stuff. I run my daughter to and from school, like, you know, and all the other little fine things, ordering frames, framing things, entering my work into shows like the Planar Easton deadline is coming up. I need to submit something like all of those things. Like I've got um, AIS has a deadline coming up, OPA, um, several other shows that I want to enter. And I'm looking around my studio going, OK, well, what do what work do I have available that I can enter. Right. And if I don't have anything, do I have enough time to create something? Which that's always a big question. Um, so yeah, all those little things. I mean, and, and too, even at Plain Air Easton, like everybody sees us out painting, but what they don't see is they don't see us like um, back at our host house photographing our work before right. it gets sold. Cause you know, it disappears. So you want a record of it. You got to photograph it. You have to I usually don't sign my paintings until they're dry because I don't like signing wet paintings. So I'll go through everything and sign everything. I'll, then framing and then labeling. Okay, and we have an inordinate amount of paperwork that like most people don't see, but we you have to <laughs> right. do all that stuff to keep the sales straight. Right. Yeah, and then yeah. too, if you want to promote that you're here at the event, you know, you've, you've got to put stuff on social media and talk about it. And that, I mean, all of that takes time. I, I so guess, let me ask a quick question on that, uh, uh, Kim, for people out yeah. there listening. And you probably had this question before, but of all the things that you do, you know, to, to, to promote and to, you know, keep your career going and, and make people know about it. What would be, of all the things you do, what would be two things, if you could only do two, that you would do every day? To promote my career? Yeah. Um, for sure, social media, because it's free. <laughs> That's a big one. And over time, you can develop quite a reach with it. Um, and the other thing would be um, just doing personal outreach to the collectors who I have their contact information. Gotcha. Okay, good. Um, I was curious. Yeah, because I, I think that those two have been the most effective with me um, for my career, you know. And then, you know, there's other, like, different degree, different things that you can do, like reaching out to your galleries from time to time, just staying in touch with them. That's, that's helpful as well. Now, just because I know, I know Kim and I think that something that she, she could like lead a whole training session on is about like relationship building. And it is something that like you have felt has been really important in terms of both 
growing your um, career as an educator and also growing your sales is she is really great at staying in touch with her collectors and, you know, sending them little treats and letting them know what's happening with her career. And she is a plein air Easton artist that does have a lot of repeat sales from the same people, which is not necessarily that common. You know, there are plenty of people who say, oh, well, you know, I already have my Jill Basham. Like now I'm looking for, for somebody else. And Kim has like quite a few people at Plenary Easton who have multiple paintings of hers. And I think part of it is this like continual dialogue. It doesn't just end at Plenary Easton, right? No, no. And and well, you, I why haven't I, why haven't I ever been contacted? <laughs> <laughs> She's gonna. Add I to look at list. one of your paintings every day. <laughs> Well, I don't have your address. I have to send it to the Avalon Foundation. I'm just kidding. Go ahead, so, Kim. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, no, no. Um, well, okay. Was there a question? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> just the, 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 the idea that people, uh, that, you know, you're, oh. you're, people come back to your collection. Yeah. And I, I just want to say, I mean, we can go into like some of the, the things that I do, which I'm happy to talk about. But I, I do want to say that one of the biggest is when I try and maintain contact, it's it's not going after the sale, you know, it's, as I've learned about relationship building, that's the biggest thing. It's not about going for the sale. It's about building those connections with people and, and just keeping, you know, keeping them informed that you're still around. And, you know, I've had people who I've sold a painting to, and then they followed my career because I've kept in touch with them. And then five years later, they bought another painting. So it's not always like about the next immediate sale. Sometimes it's just about keeping in touch so that when they are ready, they will come to you. Or when they see the right painting, they'll come to you. So, or how they can connect you with their friends and their social network. That too. Yeah. So I don't. I don't try and be like salesy, like, you know, hey, these are my latest five paintings. Come look at them. I'll just, you know, say, hey, you know, I just wanted to touch base and wish you whether it's a happy holidays or thinking of you or, hey, I'm going to be at Planar Easton next month. Hope you'll stop by and say hi. I mean, you know, just not saying here's my stuff. Please buy it. Just saying, hey, you know, just keep in touch. How you doing? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, that's... no, I think it's a really good pointer. And again, it's something that I've seen her differentiate herself over time doing. Yeah, um, it I sounds wanna... like it. Because the last time these guys talked, it was a three hour and a half conversation. <laughs> so, um... We solved all the problems of the world, but we're not we're not really ready to share that with um, with the podcast world. <laughs> this won't be a three hour um, podcast. But, uh, <laughs> don't worry, everybody. Um, Kim, <laughs> let's take a step back. And so. There had to be a time when you decided to lean in harder to to fine art and to 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 painting in general. Like there had to have been some evolution where you um, cut that paycheck cord and decided to to do <laughs> do more painting. And I know that you're you're a mom, and that um, I don't really know how the timeline worked there or how the pieces sure. kind of came together. Um, well, for me, I was working as a graphic designer. Um, I had both my own company and then I have also worked for other people as well, full time, you know, nine to five. But um, when my husband and I were trying to have kids, it was difficult for me to get pregnant. And we thought maybe that the job stress was part of it. So um, I quit my job and he and I had talked about me staying home with um, the kids because he was the one that was earning a little bit more than I was. Um, so I did, once I got pregnant, I quit all the graphic design work and stayed home with my son who, that was a real difficult transition for me because I, I was so career focused and this big switch of staying home with somebody that doesn't talk to you all day long was really, it was really strange. You know, you, you go from being really important in the working world to being really important to this little human being, but like they can't. They can't express it, and you're trying to remind yourself that your job is really important, even though you've kind of lost that same sensibility in the workplace. So um, I'd always wanted to paint. Um, that had been, a, I mean, obviously, because we talked about what I wanted to do before I went into college, but that was always a fantasy of mine. And um, one year for Christmas, my husband bought me an easel because he's like, look, you know, maybe you just need to maybe you need to find yourself in painting. And it started out like so many of my things do as a hobby. Sure. 
And after about two years of taking painting classes, um, I realized this is what I want to do full time. And then it was a matter of, and it's still an ongoing process of figuring out how to make a career of this and how to earn a living at this job, because there's no a follow this A, B, C, D, E, F, G plan. And, oh, now you can just collect that paycheck. This right. is not that kind of a job. So it took a long time to figure out how to do this. Well, but um, what, I have two questions. First of all, how yeah. old is your son now? 16. Okay. Seven, oh, no, he's going to be 17 at the end of the month. Oh, my gosh. And then <laughs> in terms of figuring it out, like you said, and how hard it is, how's it going in the 16 years it, since you've been doing it? It's going really well. Um I, you know, it, but it took a long time. You know, I think probably the last seven or eight years have, you know, everything's really like taken off. And in particular, the last four or five years have like just, I mean, yeah, my life's really changed. It's, and it's been amazing. But I wish that there had been more training in that aspect of how to earn a living as a painter because there's, I just I learned so much on my own through doing my own research and trial and error and talking to other artists and hearing about what works for them. And it's it's a very frustrating profession in that way that there's no like clear path to success. Um, but, yeah, just well, it sounds I don't like, know what my point was. <laughs> it sounds like that, that's what we should be the second. What, like, So you think you crack some sort of code to this? No, no. I think that I found what works for me because that's the other thing. Well, I guess if you, could make a, There's... if you could make a training course, would it just be, okay, do what works for you? Or what would it be in the training course when you said you wish there had been some sort of thing? Um, I would, I would share what, what has worked for me and what I found that hasn't worked for me. But I would also never discourage anyone from not trying something that hasn't worked for me because I've seen a lot of other artists get successful using you know, strategies that I don't use. Um, um, you know, back in the early days of the daily painter movement, um, Carol Marine, who's, who I think a lot of artists will know that name. She advocated a lot for selling your work on, um, auction websites like eBay and starting the pricing at a dollar. And, <laughs> but it worked for her. She has built an incredibly successful career, doing that but she came out with a book that that talked about doing that and i tried that and it failed miserably that didn't work for me so but i have seen it worked for other artists so it's you know there's a million different pathways you can take in this business and you can absolutely blaze your own trail so i would but i wish that i had more of that knowledge that info available to me so i could figure it out because there's just not a ton of it out there you know how do you approach a gallery like that kind of stuff like i had to figure all that stuff out on my own um you know that's the kind of stuff i would share and have shared with other artists that um so learn from me so, so let's take a break and when we go back let's dive a little bit deeper into some of those things that have worked for you kim because like i i'm I'm like sensing your faltering confidence, which which I don't think you should be coming to the table with, because I think that you actually have spent a lot a lot of time trying to to figure it out and balance it. And I think you actually do have some really key takeaways that, again, may not work for everybody, but nothing works for everybody. So, you know, let, let's dive deeper into how you have been successful after these words from our sponsor. Yeah, real quick. Did, when your son was talking to you, you couldn't communicate with him when he was younger. Was he saying like goo goo? <laughs> yeah, it was mostly farting noises. Wah, <laughs> wah, wah. We'll be right yeah. back in one second. Hey everyone, producer of the pod Nick Richards here with a quick message from Plan Air Easton. One thing we've learned over the course of creating the Plan Air Easton podcast is the value that our participating artists find in the camaraderie and socializing opportunities that our festival provides. Painting can often be an isolating practice, but for eight days in July, our artists get to talk shop with others equally as passionate as they are. 
If you are a plein air artist looking for this type of opportunity to practice your craft with fellow artists, if you want to challenge yourself and explore new artistic realms, if you want to present your work to a large pool of eager collectors, then this is your year to apply for the 18th annual Plein Air Easton Art Festival and Competition. Over 58 artists will compete for over $30,000 in prizes. You can find more information and apply today through January 21st, 2022 at pleneareaston.com. I really hope to see you there, and maybe next year we'll be interviewing you on the podcast. All right, let's get back to it. All right, everybody, welcome back. I hope we got that laughing on there. These two ladies have been laughing <laughs> through the whole... It's, it's really nice to hear, actually. Um, we even just made Tim laugh a little bit there, right, just by right. laughing uh, on our own. Uh, I'm laughing inside where it counts. Um, we are with uh, Kim Vanderhoek back uh, Planner Easton podcast with uh, Jess Bellis and Tim Wagon. Thank you all for joining us and sticking with us. Um, Jess, we were you so wanted again, to go back into like, something, it, right? You know, I I, I appreciate um, Kim that you can't go to school in like professional artist one hundred and one. And like for those who know me, <laughs> you know, I certainly have a very strong business background. I went to business school. Like I, that is how I sort of deconstruct everything. And I I I often think that. Um, artists whether it is like architects or graphic designers or again we're talking about fine artists right now but you can really benefit from some of those marketing classes and some of those business classes because there is so so much business minded sort of aspect to it so we were talking about building a successful art career and what has worked for you so you know you talked about um, being present and active on social media and you talked about really working to build relationships that those were two of like the key cornerstones that have have been successful for you what other advice would you give um, artists who are sort of in that in-between space about is this a hobby or is this something that I should make a go at um wow how do I advise somebody about whether they should make a go at it I I would say, you know, put your work out there and see how you react and how you feel once it starts selling and um, and see if you want to deal with the pressure of um, having to create and having to feed a gallery or having to promote yourself because, yes, the business side of things isn't for everybody. Some people, they just want to create and they're just thrilled doing that and there's nothing wrong with that you know that's a totally valid way of creating artwork but you know but if you do want to earn a living at this there you know yeah there's some pressure situations right you've got to generate work regularly you got to do outreach um i find with my students the the students that i've taught and the people that i mentor one of the biggest hurdles across the board is has to do with their confidence and has to do with that reluctance to put their work out there and also to kind of put themselves out there personally as well. It's a lot easier, I think, for most visual people to just stand behind the artwork. Just well, we can put the art out there because that's hard enough, right? Well, especially when you know, maybe it doesn't sell or you get negative feedback or you get criticism. But then also when you put yourself out there publicly, that's another very frightening thing. But fact of the matter is the old school way of earning a living as an artist where galleries would approach an artist and they would pay them and then take, you know, 20 paintings out of their studio and you never had to, you know, put yourself out there publicly, that whole business model has been long dead. And in order to earn a living at this, you've got to push your work out there because nobody's going to come knocking on your door. If you're hiding in your studio, creating magnificent pieces, nobody's going to know about them unless you, you know, you take a deep breath and you believe that what you do has value and you what you create has value. Um, so, I do a lot of confidence building with students because I, I keep hearing over and over again, they'll say things like, well, you know, I, I just really have a hard time posting on social media and I feel like I'm, you know, annoying people. And I, 
you know, I feel like I'm putting it out there too much and I've posted that painting. And if I post it again, people are going to, you know, get sick and tired of seeing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> and I, I, I have to remind them, you know, no, it's not everyone's going to see your post the first time. It's OK to repost stuff. You know, you've got to keep pushing your work out there. It's and it it's a difficult thing. I, I know it's a difficult thing. I've I go through those moments, too, where I'm like, OK, great. I've won an award. I'm really excited that I've won an award. And gosh, it just feels so braggy putting it course, on social yeah. media or in my newsletter. It feels so braggy and so narcissistic. But at the same time, like your collectors, they want to know those things. They want to know. Yeah, it know. makes us feel good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your friends want to know those things. The people that follow you, that love your work, that want to be supportive, they want to know those things. So it's okay to put that out there, but it's it's hard to do. So I guess that would be my first thing: would be <laughs> just do some confidence building. You know. Um, no, I think that yeah. that's really good advice. We could all use a little confidence building right now. I feel like. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, who, I mean, you can use it all the time. I mean, it's, that's excellent advice. Uh, you know, it, it is hard to put your put your name on things without feeling like you're bragging, you know, especially, you know, where it kind of taught, well, it's a little bit different nowadays, and, and, but for, for, you know, it, it used to be you, did, you weren't really, you didn't say me, 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 me. You didn't, you didn't brag a lot. So, um, yeah. Well, your galleries used to do that for you. Right. Oh, there you go. So the artists wouldn't have to do it. So we could just be in the studio creating. But that whole model, it's gone. business model is gone. Yeah, the, 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 you know, so artists have to take it in their own hands. Well, and if you're, and you're, and if you're a plein air painter there. and you want to engage in the festival circuit, that takes it to like a whole new level. That is really yes. putting yourself out there and in the moment. And it, it is, it, it takes like studio painting to some kind of performance level. And, you know, that's always been a careful right. balance that as an event promoter, I've had to sort of think about is, again, you guys are not like the trained pet monkey circus animals who are out there performing your tricks for everybody. This is your professional job. But you are sort of out there performing in person. People are witnessing the creative experience um, on, a, on, a, on a very personal, uh, in-person level, which, you know, when you're hiding in your studio and you're producing the masterpieces and it's like magic, they're showing up. It's a totally different game. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's different with the plein air circuit, too, because you're also engaging with the public. Right. So it's not just painting. You're actually painting and talking to people at the same time, which can be a real challenge. Um, I know a lot of artists that they they don't want to yeah. talk to people while they're painting. And and I get that it's hard to create your best work when your attention's divided between, you know, this intense focus on making the best possible painting you, that you can and also answering a question um, or multiple questions from the public or having a whole audience like during the plein air east and quick draw well, standing behind you when it's 140 degrees and, uh... <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take this from the audience or the or the the public's perspective or perspective perspective here is is there a way if i'm walking down the street in easton during plein air easton in 2022 that I can tell if an artist gives me a look to not go up to them? Um, it's kind of a joke know, question. Would... It's not a real serious <laughs> question. Like, I, you know, well, do you guys ever think, give off you know, the, 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 whatever the vibe? That, like, hey, don't come over here. Yeah. You yeah, do? Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I don't think it's during quick draws because I yeah, think we all know a, a like, that's level. a public event. Yeah. But I think that if you encounter an artist out in the field, field just randomly yeah. <laughs> and they've got their headphones on yeah. chances are they don't want I was to gonna say, to I, really, I really feel like the headphones and like there's a moment of head like if you go up and talk to them and they have their headphones on if it takes them three beats to pull their headphones out to talk to you you know they didn't really want to talk to you and you should like well, wrap it up and right, move right, along exactly. and if you're right. walking up and they're popping their headphones off because they're like oh hey I'm glad that I have right. a little break that's different, but I feel like the headphone cue is like a huge one to be looking at. Uh, pretty much everybody has those earbuds or something that they're hiding in. Right. And if they're talking to themselves, chances are they're on a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> that's another. That's another good point. They're probably talking for three hours with their friends. Right. Right. And but just to but, bring it full, if you are the public listening, it don't you should definitely walk up to them and talk to them anyway. <laughs> I do it at any yeah, time. But, anyway. I was just curious if it was a but signal. Let me. 
But let me just say, and maybe this has been said on the podcast before, especially if you're engaging with a woman artist, please don't sneak up behind us. Yeah. <laughs> please, you know, come around to the front of our easel where we can see you coming towards us because it, it can be quite frightening. I've had some encounters myself where I'm like, whoa. Right, you get really <laughs> caught off guard. No, that's, that's a good Yeah, thing. are you going to throw me in a ditch? You know, please, yeah, please just. Oh, my um, God. Come, I know, come I know. it is. You know, there's, I, people, there's a lot like, of gender the things. No, great. there's a lot of gender things that people don't think about. And, uh, you know, that could be a whole podcast in, in and of itself. You know, I think Ugh. that there's a really interesting, like, male female dynamic that exists within the, the plein air culture. And I think that it is difficult. Like, we, it is, it is one of the many male dominated, um, uh, industries that still is out there, I think. And again, some of that is changing as everything is changing, but. You know, I do think it is an interesting uh, topic. I, but I find I find most people they want to they're trying to be really polite. Yes. They're trying not to disturb you. Which whether you're male or a male or female painter, like you know, having anyone just be like hi right behind you and they're like a foot away and you haven't heard them approaching because you're really Absolutely. focused. Like I get that they're trying to be really respectful and not disturb you, but at the same time, like you know, holy moly there's someone not like a foot away and I didn't hear you so, approach, so. But like diving in just a, like shifting gears completely and and just diving yes. into one other sort of aspect but that still is kind of like gender based you know I think Kim your career was on a real high upward trajectory and the pan- it and, was oh, no no wait, 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 wait <laughs> and the pandemic hit and that was like yeah, a oh, real Lord. challenge for everybody and I think that y- your career has continued to to, to skyrocket through the pandemic, or you can speak to that. But it, 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 when we talk about balancing our family lives and our careers, and now, you know, you live in California in a fairly modest house with your full family that's all of a sudden locked down. Can you talk about the mm-hmm. last couple of years and trying to maintain balance and creativity through like really challenging times, especially when I think career wise, the demands on your work didn't necessarily let up. No, they increased, which was mind blowing. I mean, and not at like the beginning part of the pandemic when we first went into lockdown and I saw every single plane air event that I had scheduled for the year, just (laughs) cancel it all in a week's time. And all these art shows that I was supposed to be in, you know, yeah, all that stuff. But then once I think everybody had adjusted and pivoted to the new world, then things pick pick back up again. But man, it, you know, it was really difficult to, especially in the first part when both my kids were doing homeschool. And then my husband is an architect who has his own business and he works from home too. So there were now four of us <laughs> In our house, <laughs> everybody, three of them on computers all day long, right? right? And like somebody having to parent and make sure that the kids, well, and you know, some days we were more successful than others that the kids are actually in school and not playing Minecraft or watching YouTube videos while they were <laughs> doing it's a battle. And my it's husband's a battle trying to work. I know and well. I'm trying to work. Yeah, it's it was really tough. And then, you know, I. I'll be honest, I, crap, Jess and I have talked about this. I think everybody went through this tremendous phase of adjustment where, you know, this, I know I got depressed just going, holy crap, like the whole world has changed. My life as I knew it has like just come to a screeching halt. How am I going to do this? You know, how How am I going to do Yeah. And yeah, it took a while to kind of dig out of that. But as a landscape painter, because I wasn't able to travel and because I couldn't do all the events and things that I enjoy doing and even doing plain air in my area was challenging because I live in an urban area. So when I would go out and paint, there were always people around, which made me really uncomfortable. Um, so working in my studio on a landscape was almost a, a wonderful little way of escaping for me because I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't really travel and paint. When you were, when um, you were creating so. those sort of pandemic landscapes were they mostly from photo references like were you happy to have all were you happy to have had your iphone with you on all your travels was that where you found inspiration absolutely yes absolutely so it was either um my photo reference or a combination of photo reference and plein air 
Um, but yeah, mostly it was photo reference just because there's your only option, even though I, well, just because even though I have plein air studies, you know, as an artist, I just wanted to see something new. Right. Even if I was looking at a photo of something I shot, you know, years ago, I was looking at something different other than, you know, when you're doing a, when you have a plein air study, you've already stared at that scene for several hours right. and you've got a good working understanding of that scene. And while I, I, did recreate some of those larger. It was nice having a photo to stare at for for that many hours and gain an understanding of that particular scene and translating that into a painting. It was just a new new form of visual stimulus, which I find that I myself really need. I need new visual input regularly. Well, maybe you have just answered my my sort of final question that I love to ask sort of everybody. And again, I think it, it it's very connected to where I continue to find myself struggling is when you are in a fairly like burnt out or overwhelmed state, when the, when it all feels like too much and you are being asked to be creative and produce creative things, what advice do you have for anybody who finds themselves in that situation to um, forge ahead and create, create projects or, or, or products or, or, or even just find the joy that like feeds the, the good productivity when you find yourselves trapped in your home with the, with, with the <laughs> pandemic and the fires surrounding you oh, yeah, and yes. your kids are like coming unglued and falling out of school and your husband will not <laughs> empty the dishwasher no matter how many times you have asked him. Like, how do you paint that prolific painting? Like, how do you do that? She's talking about when Delta Cron comes. Ugh. Right. Oh, <laughs> Lord. Um, you know, for me, it was just going in the studio and putting on the kind of music that I enjoy listening to really loudly. <laughs> what, 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 is, what, 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 would your play, what would be on your playlist? Like, what is a go-to song that you're like, all right, I got to do it? Motley Crue. Let me tell me, what I, tell me if I guess it. <laughs> That's a good one, but no. <laughs> um, the Indigo um, Girls. No. <laughs> Chicago Blues. No. Oh, this is fun. <laughs> Let's see what Tim really the knows Whalers. about me. Uh, no. Dar, Dar Williams. Dar Williams. <laughs> no. All right, I give up. Okay. Um, but I. She's not going to tell us. You can't just like move on. Okay. Well, okay. Well. Save, save right, it to the I, save well, it to the end of the interview. People get weird when I talk about my music. Mo- They're like, Mozart. You listen to Mozart? that? You're not allowed to. You're no. not. You're never allowed to Dude, say. Ooh, we listen to all music. We and listen somebody, to every bit of music. That's just here. messed. That's messed up. If somebody like declares the kind of music that they like, you're never allowed to say ew. That's like against <laughs> all rules. No, of course we listen to. We've had everything here. We do it. 250 times a year typically so like every music is cool with us okay well if it's not if i'm not listening to rock which i love the black keys um i'll listen to billy eilish but what i've been listening to a lot lately is is rap and yeah, i'm hip-hop. i love rap i have yeah have for a long long time if you follow me on social media you probably have guessed that by now but um, yeah, I listen to a lot of rap, which my kids find hilarious because I listen to what some of the stuff that they're listening to. So. so if you could see, if you could go to one concert like right now and you wouldn't have to worry about any, like living dead, like you, I was just like, Kim, I got tickets to see who would it be? Well, alive, it would be Megan the Stallion. Uh-huh. Love it. <laughs> see? Oh, dead. Let's well, see. I mean, it just could be anybody. Oh man, baby Biggie. There you go, the West Coast. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that 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 would be pretty incredible. I've seen. But I saw Puff Daddy in I his saw, heyday, and that was pretty. That was a pretty awesome. I saw. Concert. I'll I date myself. Saw I saw. I saw the Beastie Boys with Run DMC. Oh man, that would be an epic that was show. Pretty epic. That would be really oh, fun. Oh man, crazy that would be really fun. So you turn on some music, and what's the next step? You try to blow. You try I turn to on some music. push all the rest out. I shut the door. <laughs> Is there a deadbolt? Is that something that you would recommend? I, Any locking I mechanism? I would if you can install it. Yeah. The do not disturb on your phone. The yes, yes, and um, I, I, I'll put a, a panel on my easel, and I'll say to myself, you know what? 
nobody has to see this. This is just for me, you know, and I don't care if it turns out well. Fuck it. You know, I'm just going to have fun, play around. If something happens, great. If it doesn't, no one, no one ever has to know. So, <laughs> That's but like, great. But to, but to and, summarize it, use good music, which I like because we're concert promoters. Number two, but number two is carve out the actual time. Put yourself yeah. in the space and try to remove the pressure of production in that moment Absolutely. because the stress is too high. And, and, and the, the, just doing the doing is, is as much as you can ask of yourself. Does that sum it up? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, too, when I, if I produce something that's crap, because it's, it happens, it always happens, especially if you're experimenting a lot, your, your risk of failure is very high compared to success. So if I'm experimenting and I'm doing some new stuff and I'm trying new things and I fail, Look, the best thing you can do at that point is to be like, okay, you know, it's it's easy to get bogged down into, oh my gosh, that's the worst painting. I'll never paint anything great again. No, like next, like push that off to the side and just go on to the next painting. It's, you know, it's like life. You can't, don't let that stuff well, uh, weigh you down. Just move also on. Also like life, things are going to smack you down and make you, you, know, you know, second guess yourself and that sort of thing. Did you ever have a situation yes. like that, just real quickly? I mean, something like that was like, just so because it's going to happen. I know it's happened. You know, it, it can, you can't do it for sixteen years without not, not yeah. happening. Uh, absolutely, all the time happens. Still, you know, getting rejected from a show that I wanted to get into. I've I've learned how to recover from a lot of that stuff, though, because I know there's always another show to apply to. But yeah, discouraging things. Having a slump in sales can be discouraging. You know, where you go for a few months, you're like, oh my gosh, I'll never sell a painting again, you know, or a string of bad paintings or um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of no, any it's, other it's, things. But yeah, I've had a bunch of things throughout my career, you know. Well, and again, give me time. I'll think of I'll think of a good story. Well, what I'll just say too is is the high pressure of of doing the the circuit. I mean, again, it's like if you are at Plenar Plenar Easton and you're not, it's not one of your best weeks of the year in terms of your creative output. Right. You might be di- which happened to me this yeah, year or like, last year. I mean, year. I, again, yeah. I think that like you can't have like a C plus week and feel good about leaving plein air Easton. And like, we don't all have our best weeks every week of the year. You know, I think that that's, I think that that definitely happens to people here where they get here and they're like, bleh, I don't know. Like I just can't find my footing this time. And, you know, I think that that that's like kind of where life is just smacking you down. And it's like not even necessarily totally in your control at that point. I don't think. Right. I know. Yeah. For me, absolutely. Last, this last planar Easton and as Jess knows, and I think Tim probably knows a bit too, like the whole year of plain air for me was just literally about if I can get to my easel and produce something, that's a win for me because I lost my friend Greg LaRock yep. and he, he started out as my painting teacher, kind of became an unofficial mentor and then became a good friend somewhere along the line. And so for me, every time I paint, I'm using some things that he taught me. And after I lost him, sorry, I'm going to cry. Okay. I was, That's but, real. Yeah. After I lost him, you know, it was really hard to stand at the easel because I'd be like, I'd painting, be painting a reflection in water and think, you know, Greg taught me how to do this. So... And then the last time I'd plein air painted with somebody, and it was during 2020, the last time I'd plein air pa- painted in 2020, I was with Greg. So for 2021, just standing in front of my easel and producing anything halfway decent was miraculous. And I really felt, because with, as you guys know, with Easton, you're dealing with the heat and humidity, the pressure of performance, you know, plus juggling all the other things that you need to be doing and, and trying to do throughout the week. But I literally felt like I was pushing memories out of the way in order to stand in front of my easel all year. And, you know, luckily I did produce some good work, you know, it wasn't all bad, but I did produce a whole lot of fails and wipers. And I had some problems where one of my panels fell apart while I, I had one of my competition paintings on it and was about 
three quarters of the way through and the panel started coming apart, had to wipe off the entire painting and <laughs> start Smackdown. with something well, no, different. No, I think the Smackdown, yeah. I think the Smackdown was actually Greg's death. I'm very sorry about, about that for you. Um, no, I mean, we're, we're, we're all really sorry yeah, about that. that. And, you know, one of the things that I, I know, I know is that Greg lives on through the people that he inspired and the people that he mentored and the people who he was friends with and that his work is still alive in Kim. Like you would not be the painter yeah. that you are today if it was not for our dear friend. And you know, you are you right. you having the courage to move through the grief and pick up that brush and produce at all is a tri- a, 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 tri- a tribute to Greg. And that is part of the reason right. why you have to continue to do it even when it is hard is because that is that is his his legacy lives through through artists like you. Yeah, I, I, plus he'd be pissed. Yeah, if he'd I be didn't. really pissed. He'd actually be paid be calling me up going, Yeah, you'd what be the in hell? big trouble. You'd be in big <laughs> exactly. trouble. Yeah, I think uh, it's yeah. always a good opportunity, you know, to make sure you check out uh, Kim's work uh on online at kimbranderhoke.com, I think is probably where it is. And yeah, and she has gosh, yeah. she has so much um both creative content and I know she does a lot of teaching and mentoring. Kim, do you want to give give some of your um your tags and your Instagram and your, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly put it in the, um, the, I sound like yeah. not a technical person, the, the like tags and just, stuff to this. Just but, real um, quick. So the segue wasn't that, that, uh, great. I also want to say, you should also check out Greg LaRock stuff. If he, I'm sure you can find it if you yeah, Google it or whatever, yeah. because we do talk about him a lot on this show and it'd be good to, if you're, if you're out there, just even if you know him to revisit some of his stuff. Kim, sell yourself yeah. in these last <laughs> few moments. How can people reach you? How can they see your work and, um, get connected with you to learn more? My website's kimvanderhoek.com. Um, you can find me. I'm really active on Instagram, and that's at kim underscore vanderhoek. Um, I do a lot of painting reels, short videos, where you can watch me paint. Um, I'm also on Facebook. I'm a, I'm a bit less active on Facebook, but I'm there. And I, I have a TikTok, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is also kim underscore vanderhoek. I'm I'm trying to do the TikTok. It's hard to juggle all the things, but I'm really invested in Instagram. I also have two online courses, Landscape Essentials and Terrific Trees. So if you're interested in those, I do some um, one-on-one mentoring as well, which you can find more information about on my website. And I'm probably going to release a few more courses this year. But yeah, you can find me anywhere. I'm not. I'm not hard to find. If you want to find me, just uh... and she's got she's got so much to offer. <laughs> Kim, there. I always love talking to you. I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Thank, Thank you. you so much for hopping on the podcast. We we will have to have you back to cover more topics. We, and um... we, we, yeah, we got to do the it. rapid fire questions next time. We got to right. do rapid. Oh fire. yeah. Oh, we didn't do those. Oh, okay. Well, we're out of I'll time. Be, I, All I, right. I'll give you. I'll give you one. Uh, Broadway play or movies? Uh, Broadway. Okay, play. good. That's Kim Vanderhoek, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Kim thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the Eastern Shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit AvalonFoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. The Plein Air Easton Podcast is produced by Nick Richards. Our theme music was generously provided by Blue Dot Sessions, with additional episode music by Poddington Bear. Remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. You can learn more about Plein Air Easton at PlanAirEaston.com.